So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, politics and public space. Um, I read not long ago that the uh, mayor of Madrid, Ana Botella, uh, wanted to ban all protests in the center of the Spanish capital. Anyone who's traveled to Spain in recent years has come across protesters in public spaces like the Plaza de Catalunya in Barcelona, where a village sprang up after the Spanish economy collapsed, akin to the one in New York's Zuccotti Park. There were bloody clashes just a few weeks ago when police tried to clear the plaza. Um, and that's them. Um, in Madrid, tens of thousands of demonstrators took over the Cologne uh, Square in March, and this is them, uh, rallying against the continuing unemployment and EU-related austerity measures. There, too, protesters clashed with police. Um, so the mayor, who earlier this year cracked down on buskers, these are street musicians, um, provoking this wave of mockery on YouTube, um, she petitioned the national government to prevent all gatherings in central Madrid. At a time when the city needs to attract tourism and investment, she said, demonstrations, quote, undermine the city's image. I would say the reverse is true. They prove to me, in any case, the vitality and resilience of the Spanish. Here in Prague, the overthrow of the communist regime seems to an outsider like me to have transferred authority a little hurriedly from the old Soviet-era ruling class to the free market, which, like the whole neoliberal agenda, can be often reckless and an indifferent steward of urban values. Uh, Martin Barry has written, actually, about a certain passivity uh, passed along from the earlier Soviet era to this one, a complacency when it comes to community involvement and to the sort of ground-up social activist mode of urban engagement uh, that you heard a little bit about before in Berlin and for which I think Prague used to be famous and that elsewhere, as in Spain, centers around public space, around the political, economic, social, and symbolic values represented by public space. This reticence may stem, Martin has said, partly from a sense that the status quo here is fine, which it clearly is, but a thriving and progressive democracy depends on vigorous public debate about public space. Bygone, top-down models of governance and of urban planning and architectural development, which are deaf to public input, risk being out of touch with precisely the sort of creative urbanism that the most competitive and dynamic cities encourage. This is, I know, in part why we are here and what Recite has been created to combat. It's an antidote to indifference and complacency. We've witnessed some consequences of this indifference in places like Kiev, where demonstrators, oh, I have it right here, why am I keep looking backwards, where demonstrators took over Independence Square, and in Cairo, where they occupied Tahrir Square. The reverberations from Tahrir now include the death sentences handed down by a judge in March on 529 Egyptians associated with the deposed Muslim Brotherhood who were accused of attacking a police station in Minya where an officer was killed in August. As for Istanbul, last summer's occupation of Gezi Park in Taksim Square, and the crackdown there by government forces emboldened opponents of Prime Minister Erdogan to press for corruption charges, and in response, Erdogan this spring, as you may know, blocked Twitter and YouTube to prevent the sharing of what he has called false allegations of corruption and of wrongdoing. Local elections in April in Turkey provided a vote of confidence for Erdogan, who used that victory to threaten mass arrests of detractors and encourage his enemies to flee the country. Clearly, the protests in Gezi had a point about threatened freedoms. Erdogan speaks for Turkey's religious conservatives who constitute roughly half the country, many of whom felt themselves marginalized under Turkey's secular rulers. Gezi, like other public spaces for protest, became a kind of crucible for dissent, forging an alliance of diverse opponents, urban intellectuals, secular-minded Turks, nationalists, all of whom, in a sense, discovered each other and their shared grievances on the common ground of the park. I want to unpack some notions about public space, its design and uses, a topic of widespread discussion these days. I will first state the obvious about the body politic. 
that when we talk about the politics of public space, we are talking both about space and bodies, about the physical presence of bodies occupying space, which is inseparable from and constantly reformed by the interactions of those bodies. Spaces are not fixed. They constantly change. I want to look at specific public spaces occupied by protesters like Zuccotti and Gezi, but then to broaden the conversation to include public space more generally, because when we talk about politics and public space, we miss the point if we limit ourselves to sites of protest. So my main focus will turn to projects in Egypt, Venezuela, and the West Bank. Asked about the deaths of migrant workers constructing a stadium in Qatar, more than 830 Nepalese and Indian laborers have been killed on World Cup construction sites there so far. A well-known architect was recently quoted saying, I have nothing to do with the workers. It is not my duty as an architect to look at this. Her partner then denounced, quote, moralizing political correctness, saying it is, quote, trying to paralyze us, architects, with bad conscience and arrest our explorations if we cannot instantly demonstrate a manifest tangible benefit for the poor, as if the delivery of social justice is the architect's competency. I should have added earlier that the spaces we design are shaped not just by the bodies that use them, but also by the people who build them. And I am grateful for these unfortunate remarks by these two architects, because they help to accelerate a timely conversation. There is a dialectic undercurrent that runs throughout this talk between design and adaptation, intention and improvisation, control and formlessness, engagement and isolation. Architects don't act alone, but neither must they be passive. I see here a rich and promising vein for architects and planners today who want to reclaim the place of architecture and city planning at the decision-making table, to return to the center of discussions about how we live and who we wish to be as a society, and not just to devise highways or make formally and materially interesting buildings. Clearly, we can't say that protesters cannot say that protesters taking to the streets or taking over public space is anything new, but awareness of urban public space has certainly grown. Awareness on a governmental as well as a populist level of its meanings and use in a democratic society, of the relationship of its design to issues of public health, safety, social equity, and civic identity. The relationship is asynchronous but determinative between demands for public space and for democracy. When we talk about politics and public space, we should begin with the given that politics, as Judith Butler has put it, already exist, quote, in the home or on the street or in the neighborhood or indeed in those virtual spaces that are equally unbound by the architecture of the house and the square. Officials, architects and planners design public spaces to serve certain functions or prevent others. This is itself a political act. But then what happens when people use the space is that other politics are enacted. It is this enactment by changing configurations of bodies and interests within the space that makes architecture inseparable from politics. Space is a container, but also a stage for action. As Hannah Arendt said, political action requires, quote, a space of appearance. And a true polis is the organization of the people as it arises out of acting and speaking together. That is, a polis expresses itself through the interaction of people in a place. It is at once the place and the people. Arendt added, quote, it's true space lies between people living together for this purpose. So politics, you might say, happen more specifically in the spaces between us, which concentrate in public space. Much of this is understood in places like Prague and throughout Europe where the social compact for generations has presumed that in return for taxes and citizenship, the authorities of the state will supply people with essentials like mass transit, decent rail stations, good streets, housing, health care, and public spaces. 
But this social compact depends on a robust economy and willing public who share common desires. And when it is challenged, that challenge is made visible in public space. As I said about Gezi, public space reveals to the world people who might not otherwise, who might, I'm sorry, who might otherwise remain invisible to each other. But to gain attention, the act of occupation requires disrupting spaces designed and maintained for other purposes. The challenge may be as benign as sleeping in a square or holding up a banner. Whatever it is, questions of territoriality arise. Quote, territory is not ground or terrain, nor is it a given, as Saskia Sassen has written. It is a complex capability with embedded logics of power and of reclamation. And so for Sassen, Protests like the ones in Tahrir Square or Zuccotti Park cast into doubt what she calls the larger, quote, binary of national versus global by which modernity has formulated its political struggles. To occupy these spaces, she writes, is to remake their territoriality and thereby their embedded logics of power by introducing logics of sharing and solidarity. So, occupation redefines a space whose underlying logic it interrogates. Bodies and space together. Crucially, this combination implies physical sacrifice and risk. Today, the media, including social media, broadcast protests in real time around the world. The 24-hour cable news cycle, Facebook and Twitter, feed the global public's appetite for drama and expectation of bearing witness to anything and everything instantly from a safe distance. Facebook and Twitter can call people to arms and like television and smartphones, keep an eye on what's happening so that authorities may think twice about cracking down violently on protesters. It's not a coincidence that Turkish police who fired tear gas in Gezi Park were for a while chastened by worldwide broadcasts critical of their actions, while in Turkish cities that were off the media's radar, where protesters also gathered, the police felt no such constraints. So there's a symbiotic relationship. Protesters count on their being witnessed remotely in virtual space, but it is only real bodies in real space that occupy a real physical site, which provide the necessary drama of that occupation. To quote Butler again, the media requires those bodies on the street to have an event, even as those bodies on the street require the media to exist in a global arena. If this conjuncture of street and media constitutes a very contemporary version of the public sphere, then bodies on the line have to be thought of as both there and here, now and then, transported and stationary, with very different political consequences following from those two modalities of space and time. Of course, it also matters not just that spaces be physically occupied, but which spaces are occupied and how, which buildings, squares, by how many people and by whom. The protests in Gezi Park, Tahrir Square, the Plaza de Catalunya, and at Zuccotti Park in New York shared certain telltale traits. All these spaces were the consequence of urban modernization programs. All of them are spaces surrounded by buildings. The common thread contained, concentrated, but porous spaces. Tahrir and the Plaza de Catalunya are traffic hubs. Tahrir is a traffic circle, and the Plaza has a park at its center, a condition akin to Gezi, which is a scruffy little park within Taksim Square itself enclosed by streets and mostly modern hotels and other buildings. Let's focus on Zuccotti. It is a theater in the round, a mostly concrete rectangular plaza, typically used by office workers to eat lunch, bounded by streets and tall buildings so that a few hundred people can make it look crowded and more people can watch what's happening inside it from the sidelines and above. It was not until 2011 a space for protesters. There are hundreds of rallies and protests in New York every year. The Parks Department issues some 250 permits 
for rallies and vigils every year, most of them in Dog Hammarskjöld Plaza near the UN or in Union Square, Washington Square Park, Thomas Paine Park near the federal courts. Zuccotti was a serendipitous choice. Protesters had wanted to occupy Wall Street, but the police prevented them. So they came up, uh, so they set up camp, I'm sorry, three blocks north in a park next door to the World Trade Center site, which was not a public park, but one of the city's so-called privately owned public spaces. U.S. Steel, the original owner of Zuccotti, built the park in 1968 in return for the right to add additional floors to its office building on the north side of the park to make a taller building. A citywide program at the time created these quasi-public spaces by granting private developers exemptions to zoning restrictions. So mostly developers used this to create these very bar barren, horrible plazas in return for these bonuses. Kind of purposely undesirable spaces, poorly maintained, because they didn't actually want anybody uh, to gather in front of their buildings. Zuccotti was a step up design-wise from these earlier plazas. It was originally called Liberty Plaza Park, and it became a popular spot uh, in warm weather after an $8 million renovation following 9-11, when it was renamed Zuccotti Park by its new owner, Brookfield Properties. Precisely because the park was not public, it was not subject to the rules that govern public parks like the prohibition against sleeping overnight. So it became, in a sense, Occupy's site by default. The irony that Occupy could only occupy a public place because it actually took over a private one built by U.S. Steel and owned by a big commercial real estate development company, no less. This irony was lost on no one, but just as important was how that space was occupied. Its renovation a decade ago had added trees and seating, which provided cover and divided the space up in ways that protesters capitalized on. Imagine Zuccotti Park, one protester told me, as the intersecting point on a Venn diagram of characters representing disparate political and economic disenchantments. And I don't think it's coincidental that these strangers who came together at Zuccotti, as well as in Gezi and other places, all formed pop-up towns on these sites, producing in bite-sized form, at least temporarily, what they imagine to be the outlines of a larger, equitable city with separate spaces for kitchens serving free food, for legal services, with libraries, medical stations, media centers, and general stores. Aristotle, sorry, I couldn't avoid putting in a little art, talked about the ideal polis extending the distance of a herald's cry, a space in which people communicated face to face. Here again, the politicized shifting space between bodies. And it was meaningful, I think, that Zuccotti, being a contained place, allowed protesters who were prevented by the police from using microphones to address the crowd by repeating phrase by phrase, what, phrase, by phrase what speakers said, so that during speeches at Zuccotti, everyone, as it were, spoke in one voice. The same crowd, by the way, would have looked puny in a place like, say, Central Park, and there would be no one around to notice it. Similar, Gezi, similarly, Gezi Park had not been on people's radar. It was, a, you know, as many of you may know, it's a kind of shambolic, modestly used green space, very popular for yoga classes and sleeping off a hard night in Toxim. Before, it was, this was before the protests came last year, but it turned out to be, like Zuccotti, a meaningful site. It's on the edge of Toxim, a fluid, irregular, open and unpredictable place, reflecting the area's historic identity at the heart of modern multicultural Turkey. This, Toxim, was where poor European immigrants settled during the 19th century. It was a honky-tonk quarter during the 1980s, a haven for gays and lesbians, a locus of nightclubs, foreign movie palaces, and French-style covered arcades. There's a university. It's where young people and tourists congregate at night. Gravestones from an Armenian cemetery at Toxim, demolished in 1939, were said to have been used to construct stairs at Gezi Park, a Republican-era project 
by the French planner Henri Prost that brought modernism to Istanbul's urban fabric, as did the jumble of high-rise hotels that surround it. All this was precisely what Prime Minister Erdogan didn't like, and he triggered the protest by threatening to demolish and then remake Taksim as a neo-Ottoman theme park, getting rid of Gezi and undoing what several Turks described to me as, quote, their unruly commons in the middle of the city. Never mind that there is precious little public green space in the center of Istanbul. The fact that Gezi was an informal and unpredictable place made it suspicious to Erdogan and a natural center of gravity for protesters. As at Zuccotti, its compact design, surrounded by streets with shabby alleys of trees and walkways, dividing these modest lawns and disused fountains. This was ready-made for the hodgepodge of services, encampments, gardening efforts, and food stalls that divvied up the occupation site. Creative use was made of cheap materials to provide areas for picnic tables, exhibition spaces, and something called the Revolution Museum, which was itself a pop-up gallery that chronicled the history of Turkish protests. One Turk told me, Turkish people who have taken over Gezi Park in protest feel it is truly theirs, not something awarded to them by their leaders. This, I think, is critical. The notion of top-down versus bottom-up public space, spaces people are given and passively use versus spaces they remake for themselves. I want to turn from occupation because we need to define public space more broadly. It is not just an area of protest. It encompasses the entirety of the public realm that we build, and politics are no less present where this realm constitutes sidewalks, transit stations, streets, highways, bike paths, and playgrounds, where daily life happens in public. Our very definition of public, of democracy, is tested by the distribution, design, and uses of these spaces. Who controls these spaces, shapes them, and what do their physical properties say about us? Such questions have been at the heart of a larger critique of neoliberal values whose bankruptcy provided the market collapse that helped inspire the Occupy movement. And this gets to the heart of agency and authority. Some of the most intriguing examples, I think, of public action in public space aren't protests per se, but the reconfiguration of public places by people, architects, and urban designers um, who have taken matters, as, you, as it were, into their own hands, officially or otherwise. So I want to give you these three examples. The first example involves an addition to the Ring Road Highway in Cairo, made by residents of Ard Aliwa, a neighborhood bordering that highway. The highway, you see it here, is a project of Hosni Mubarak and part of Cairo's disastrous exurbanization, which has insulated many wealthy Egyptians behind the walls of gated communities on the city's outskirts. The proliferation of gated communities is a global phenomenon, perhaps the most disturbing urban trend today. Cities are expanding around the world, exploding really, as we all know, but many of them in Latin America, India, and China are modeling themselves not after places like New York or Boston or Berlin. They are mimicking American-style gated communities, the antithesis of healthy urban growth. The gated residence has become the housing complex of choice in the developing world. Its effects, in terms of open space, akin to the enclosures of agricultural land during the 17th century, which did away with the commons. By the way, what I show you here is not in Arizona or Florida, it's in Cairo. And this trend is accelerating, as you see here. I recently toured some of these gated communities um, in Cairo with their golf courses, built smack in the middle of the desert. This one here is called Katamia Heights. Mubarak, pandering to the elite, this is Katamia Heights in the middle of the desert, um, focused on highways and sprawl to encourage these developments, ignoring public transit and public spaces. In addition to the Ring Road, he also commissioned the 6th of October Bridge and Causeway, linking 
Tahrir Square, or the downtown commercial district, with affluent suburbs like Nasr City and New Cairo. In a country where only 14% of the population owns cars, and where more than 20, pe 20 million people have almost no green space, Mubarak envisioned modern Cairo as a kind of Middle Eastern version of post-war America, with freeways, automobiles, and class exodus from a festering city center. So it was natural that the 6th of October bridge became a site of violent clashes between protesters and government forces during the revolution. But something even more dramatic, I think, happened after Mubarak's fall and during the purgatory of Morsi's aborted rule. Post-revolution, Kyrenes, whose neighborhoods had been ignored by Mubarak and bypassed by his highways, constructed their own public spaces. In Imbebe, a neighborhood sometimes nicknamed the Islamic Republic of Imbebe, with a population larger than Manhattan's, I think, by the way, one of the things that really struck me in Cairo, where 70% of the city is informal settlements, you're talking about communities, neighborhoods that are as large as any European city. So when we talk about a neighborhood like in Bebe, we're talking about a million people or more. And in this area, the, committee, uh, the neighborhood committees were formed. They were called popular committees. And these committees pooled resources to fix roads that were untended, organize trash, trash collection, enhance public squares, and police the streets. Here you see in Mbebe, basically volunteers, so the popular committees, hiring a front loader to clear the streets. May al Ibrashi is an Egyptian architect with whom I spoke there about this kind of guerrilla urbanism in Cairo this was, of course, before the military takeover. She told me, what's definitely changed is that before, meaning before Tahrir, in Cairo, someone always used to dictate where you were allowed to sit and walk, what you were allowed to do or say. This new right to express yourself on the street is not minor or a luxury. The street was not really public space. Now it is. And I saw this nowhere more clearly illustrated than on that ring road I showed you earlier which was clearly built specifically to bypass and thereby isolate Ard al which, like Mbebe, is this massive, immense, informal settlement. For years, workers, by the way, including many government workers, living there in Ard al had to waste hours each day getting to jobs downtown because they couldn't take the road. The road didn't stop where they were. So in the absence of either help or interference by Morsi's government, Residents in Ardaliwa constructed their own on and off ramp to the highway. That's right, they built these ramps out of dirt, sand, and trash, and then they invited the police to open a kiosk at the interchange. It was full on do it yourself infrastructure, a massive assertion of genuine political authority over public space, and an implicit rejection of exclusionary politics. As Omar Nagari, uh, also an Egyptian architect and planner, put it to me before the takeover, this was always a revolution about unjust urban conditions and about public space. The ramp is just one example, he said. People realized they had the right to determine what happens on their own streets to their own neighborhoods, so there erupted a battle of ownership throughout Egypt over whose space this is and who determines whose space this is. That's also what happened in Caracas with the Torre David, an unfinished and abandoned 45-story office building from the early 1990s in the former central business district of the city, which has famously become the improvised home for more than 750 families. They've created, in effect, a vertical squat or slum. A team of architects based in Zurich which calls itself Urban Think Tank, has been studying this tower for years and sees in it the enormous potential for experimentation and creative reuse that characterizes most informal settlements. Residents of the David Tower have a mixed-use development with electricity, a kind of Rube Goldbergian water system, security, 
There are grocery stores, office supply stores, hairdressers, tailors, a basketball court with teams that play in local leagues. All of this in this building, which has no walls, by the way. There's a gym, there's even an evangelical church around which the building's centralized system of governance has arisen. What had been ad hoc adaptation to a site has increasingly become regulated redesign. Squatters use brick, tiles, and other found materials. This is an apartment created, two actually, uh, in the tower. They use these found materials to demarcate apartments and rooms, bringing vernacular styles of arched doorways, interior windows, and neo-colonial architecture from the barrios to a glass and concrete office tower. This adaptive reuse, claiming what is a kind of disused public space, is, quote, the microcosm of the megacity itself, as Urban Think Tank points out. It is a site for reordering the social metric. Quote, the residents unencumbered by principles of design, theories of aesthetics, or the received wisdom of the past, build what makes sense to them. This is, again, the UTT, the Urban Think Tank. They go on, if this is the future, if Torre David is the informal city writ small, architects and urban planners face a major challenge. Who and what are we to those we serve? What exactly are we doing and to what end? So UTT tried partly to answer that question by uh, proposing wind turbines and a kind of pulley system that would cheaply transport goods and people up and down a tall shaft in the absence of elevators because the vertical climb is a big issue in the building. That's the interventions they saw uh, themselves as architects playing. But I, but I think there's a more evolved answer to UTT's question. What is the role of architects and planners? Uh, in the form of a project which I just saw earlier this week um, for a refugee camp in Fawar in the southern West Bank, south of Hebron. And I will end with this example. Two architects, Alessandro Petty and Sandy Hilal, worked with residents of the Fawar camp to create a public plaza, virtually unheard of in such places, and especially problematic among Palestinian refugees for whom the creation of any permanent amenity by establishing normalcy undermines their fundamental self-image as temporary occupants with the right of return to homes in Israel. We see from this, I think, and everything else I've mentioned today, that the notion of being in public is a behavioral, not just a spatial condition, which nonetheless depends on certain spatial aspects. In refugee camps, public and private do not exist conceptually, as they do elsewhere. Property is neither public nor private in the camp. Refugees do not own their homes, nor are streets municipal properties, as they are in cities, because refugees are not citizens and the camp is not a city. The legal notion of a refugee camp, according to the United Nations, is in effect a temporary site for displaced, stateless individuals, not a civic body. There is no municipality to care for lights and garbage, and concepts like inside and outside are blurred in a place like Fawar. A mother may not wear a veil in the camp, whether she's in her home or on the street, but when she leaves the camp, she will put it on, because that is outside. So there is a powerful sense of community, and of course, after many generations in camps like Fawar, which was founded in the 19, late 1940s, you can imagine this question of permanence and citizenship is very complex. So six years ago, Petty and Hilal began a conversation with residents there about creating a public square or plaza. There's no such thing in Fawar. The residents were very suspicious, not just about normalizing the camp, but also about creating a space where men and women might come together in public. Petty and Hilal consulted groups of women and they've described to me the discussions as two-way. That is, not just the architects passively listening to what the women said, but themselves trying to envision what the women might want and what everyone could use. The question was, 
how a space can be made open so men and women might gather together while allowing the women some enclosure. They didn't want to feel exposed, the women, where they might be criticized or made uncomfortable. The plaza needed a filter, clearly, an edge. So it was decided that the space, it's, it's kind of an L-shaped space, about 50 by 100 meters. The, the space where, where there used to be disused shelters from the 1950s, which were then torn down, it should not be completely open. So a wall was devised, and you can see this wall, a low wall that runs around the space. The architects interviewed residents whose homes faced this plaza and negotiated with each one of them separately about the permeability of the wall in front of the houses and at about a cost of 300,000 US dollars for the demolition of the old shelters and the construction of the new one. The UN relief agency there, which is UNWA, in charge of maintaining the camp, paid effectively for Petty and Hilal to design this limestone plaza. Limestone was very key in order to create real image of permanence and value. And in effect, to create a house without a roof, which is what this is, the walls without a roof, as a solution to the women's problems. I should say, by the way, the image of a house without a roof is also very crucial to the Palestinian notion of having a home that is not permanent. So as camps in the West Bank became multi-generational and they, the original re shelters were replaced by more permanent structures, the, often the Palestinians did not put on permanent roofs as a kind of statement about the impermanence of their stay there. So this part, this plaza has that uh, meaning implicit in it as well. But the idea of a house without a roof also redefines public space as a place for collective privacy and ownership. The plaza is akin to the camp in making ambiguous the relationship between inside and outside. Women use it without being criticized for not being home. And as a result, the site has fostered a lot of new kinds of activities, meetings, a marketplace I was there earlier this week where women were making baskets and other things which has now become a shared industry for them which they then sell um, outside and inside and outside the, um, uh, the camp. And it's also become an occasion, a place, by the way, I should also say the women can go to this uh, plaza and gather there uh, partly because they can bring their children. Uh, there's a women's center, and there's always been a women's center in Fawar, but they, they never go because they can't bring their children there. But to the, to the plaza, they can bring their children so the women can be together while the children play. This is also crucial. And it's caused a lot of upset among men in the camp. But the plaza itself, the space, becomes the occasion for uh, this shifting conversation. And it's very crucial that this conversation be taking place now as a new generation, a younger generation of Palestinians who have grown up here are exposed to the outside world and have n other notions about permanence, citizenship, and the spaces they want to occupy. So children play there, and the plaza becomes also a refuge from the overcrowded streets around it. An older resident of Fawar recalling a former life in the Palestinian uh, times uh, outside said, we didn't have any adequate space where we could sit without feeling that we are basically sitting in the streets and blocking traffic. I think that the plaza is giving us the possibility to recreate our culture of using outside spaces. I'll just end by asking, can we design public spaces that represent us in our diversity? Can we design spaces specifically for protest? I don't think so. And what does protest yield? Egypt, of course, has recently elected a military ruler in what did not seem an entirely fair and free election, although I think it's still too early to say that Tahrir had no impact, since democratic revolutions are messy and require generations to play out. Prague itself, I might say, is a case in point. Occupy had the effect of making concepts like the 1% part of everyday speech, which instantly contributed to the election of New York's current mayor, de Blasio, who told a tale of two cities. I suspect what most politicians and private developers in America took away from the Occupy movement 
was that in future, they need to work harder to design spaces that can't be occupied. And I show you here, the, if you look in the middle, the sign there is the only sign that had existed at Zuccotti Park about what was not permitted. If you look to the left, you will see a new sign that has gone up with all the things you now cannot do in the park. And they all are geared to preventing another Zuccotti. But I think another lesson is that millions of people around the world dream of opportunity and equality, and that those dreams will continue to be contested and expressed in the public spaces we build for each other and for ourselves. Thanks.